back. That was a little uh, Back to the Future soundtrack because we're talking to a man, Steve Starkey, who worked on that film, among many other things. And his book, Breaking and Entering, The Education of a Film Producer. I'm holding it up again right there. Cool picture. Um, so you said you had a story about the picture. Oh, no. Well, yeah, the picture. Uh, I worked a little later in my Bob Zemeckis career. Uh, Which, we, that's what I want to talk about. In this yeah, segment. we formed a company called Image Movers Digital to make motion capture films. We had done the Polar Express, which was really a lot of fun. And we learned about the technology and what was possible. I turned down a part in that film. Why'd you do that? Because my face wasn't going to be seen. Oh, you're, for Christ's sake. Are you serious? No. Well, uh, who was the casting director? Victoria Burroughs. Yes. She said, Bob really wants you to do it. And it was like, it was one of those things. Tell like, you would have been perfect. You're just such a good actor. We could have made a great face for you. There you go. <laughs> I said, wait a second, I'm not going to talk or be seen. I'm just going to be in a group. But you're funny, Tim. You know, your actions are funny. You are. You use it. I was like, eh, I think I still want to be on camera. Oh, for Christ. Hey, if Tom Hanks could play nine roles, you couldn't play one? The Tom Hanks' face was seen. <laughs> sort of. Sort of. It was like this book cover. In other words, it was a digit a digi version of it. So this photograph yeah. was taken on the set of Back to the Future 2. But what happened is I said, look, I'm doing a, I called up Doug Chang and he was our lead artist at this company, Image Movers Digital. I said, Doug, who's the young Doug Chang? Because I would like to put an old studio kind of in sepia yeah. behind my a photograph for the cover of this book I'm doing. He said, I don't want anyone else to do it. I'll do it at night myself. Just send me what you, so I sent him this photograph. He kind of sepia, put a sepia tone to it. Yeah, And then he painted in Universal in the background. And that became the cover of the book. I got it, an email. I said, Doug, that's perfect. <laughs> You're a genius. Done. <laughs> Done. Uh, it's a great pick. And then and then inside the book, I'm, I'm not going to hold up. Maybe I can hold up. But there are all kinds of like crazy fun pictures of you on sets. And, and um, the one that stuck out to me, too, was the Noise is off. I forgot you yeah, worked on yeah. that. Who's, who's with Carol Burnett that? and John Ritter and Michael Caine. That was crazy, yeah, that cast. Mary Lou Henner. Mary Lou Henner, Julie Haggerty. Yeah. Mark Lynn Baker. I back... just saw Julie Haggerty and she was the mom in some. Anyway. Oh, yeah, was... yeah, yeah. I saw that too. I yeah. can't know what it was. And Carol Burnett just turned 90. Yeah. She... So this was a great cast and they were all on the same set every single day for 30 days. That must have been it hilarious. Was, it was great. And everybody got and... along? Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, too well, some of them. Okay. But yeah. I mean, I saw the that's, door. Uh, that's, saw... It's radio after dark. Uh, yeah. That's right. we'll save that story. <laughs> yeah. A lot of kissing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a lot of pictures of Frank Marshall. He's really key in your, he, in he, your life. Yeah. He was it's starting with giving me the opportunity on that documentary that brought me down to Amblin. Uh, he continued to be my mentor, uh, particularly in through Roger Rabbit and Back to the Future, where I was associate producer. He was the guy who was instrumental in, in keeping my career going. And in yeah. fact, I'm working on uh, Roger Rabbit and in a sort of undefined role, overseeing visual effects and post-production. So I'm in London working with the effects crew and I go to the theater and it was, um, which actor was it? There was an actor in the wings and Frank said, look, I want to just come and say hello. Why don't you come with me and say hello to it was Sir. Um, anyway, I can't quite remember. So I'm in there. And when he introduces me and say, hey, I'd like to introduce you to the associate produce, producer of the film, Steve Starkey. First time that 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 had come up on a film. Wow. So true to his word, Frank in the office telling me, go to Amazing Stories. We'll move you into a movie world as an associate producer. He did that on Roger Rabbit. Wow. Yeah. So, and so that's how you met Bob Zemeckis. On the set of Roger Rabbit, I was hired in this role, I, this undefined role, and came to Bob and said, hi, Bob, this is the first day of shooting in Los Angeles, red right. cars up and down the street, you know, Bob Hoskins jumping on the back of a, you know, a car. And I said, Bob, I've been hired to do the post-production and visual effects on uh, on the movie. And he said, good luck. <laughs> that was, my, that was can... my first meeting with Bob in my life. Good luck. <laughs> That's so funny. And then he and I not only bonded on that movie, taking 13 trips 
back and forth to London together to the animation facility. Right. Um, we continued on Back to the Future 2 and 3, and then he hired me as the producer on Death Becomes Her, and, and yeah. that was it. Well, a couple of things I want to point out. One is that it sounds as though you you sort of haphazardly fall into Hollywood, getting on that bus back at Universal, but you clearly, because you just would not have succeeded if you were not good at your job. Again, you look like you go to Grateful Dead concerts, but <laughs> The guy who goes to Grateful Dead concert all the time is not going to succeed the way you succeeded unless you're really good at your job. And you clearly. Yeah, I worked really hard at it. And look, I got a lot of education along the way. And and what I've come to think with this book is really is a is a thank you to all the people who mentored me and helped me. Yes. Nurtured me and taught me along the way, because, you know, you know, you can be self-taught. But it certainly helps to have people who are experts and good at the, what they do to be mentoring you and leading you, you know, into your next position. Yes. So I had the luck of always having these great people. And so I think a lot of this when I say, and he was great, I'm thinking I'm really saying, thanks, you guys, for taking me under your wing right. and letting me learn, you know, from right. you. Um, but there is a moment in the book where, and I think it's sort of like if you're from the writing standpoint. And this is, again, goes back to the journey idea. This book is not about like what Tom Hanks, you know, was right. like, although we talked about although that. I do at, have a lot of those stories. You do. <laughs> we talked, we saw each other at a party. We were talking about what we were talking about this upcoming interview. It's like, what Tom Hanks, what is Tom Hanks like? And having work on Castaway, I can say he's really nice and he's really, really funny. Like he's funny on screen, but he's genuinely witty and funny and yeah. Um, but the book is about this journey. And I feel like from a writer's standpoint, the moment Bob Zemeckis says to you, hey, I want you to produce Death Becomes Her. It's almost like that's the end of the movie. Right. Because you've made it like right. all that hard work and all those adventures. Now, suddenly Bob Zemeckis says, I want you to produce Death Becomes you Her. finally got there. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I wanted to ask you about and these particularly with bob zemeckis movies is there's always a level of technology yeah involved and i'm thinking to myself you had to stay on top of all that stuff too yeah which is if you get to know me the this grateful dead look is in fact accurate because i am the least technological you didn't know about zoom we could <laughs> yeah i don't know anything so, you know, when Bob says, OK, you know, we're going to mix animation with live action. My first adventure with him, it's like, first of all, I'd never done any animation. Right. I didn't even know what a cell looked like or how you painted it. Right. And then what do you do with it? Right. Oh, you photograph it. And then what? And all these stages of, oh, then we got to actually somehow composite it together with the real photography we do on the set and make an animated character be in there with them. Well, how the hell did we do that? You know, so, but, but did you it was just like did you Christ. say that or did you act like you knew what you were doing? No, I listened. Yeah. And Very I, good. I Most listened. people don't. No, I just listen and say, okay, all right. And then I go, Ken Ralston, who is the effects guru. Right. You know, I say, so Ken, what's the first step? He said, okay. And he would take me step by step. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna, and then what we do is when Bob has a cut of the movie. We're going to photograph every individual frame and they become the background that the animators are going to gotcha. animate over so they can see every frame in relation to what their little animated character is doing. And when you put it together, it's like those little thumb things that you do as a kid. It'll all, you know, come to life right. with the live action. I go, OK, that's good. But what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, OK, now I got the picture. Right. So it's like that. And you just go department. And I actually wrote a how to do Roger Rabbit book with the head of animation, Don Hahn, yeah. my co-associate producer. And we wrote this book to tell everybody else step by step how the heck you do. You, right. you make a shot. Wow. <laughs> Which but, I didn't know. <laughs> but again, he's always like, you know, thinking technology. And I'm hearkening back to a moment. With, I don't know if you were there, but this is when he was married to Mary Ellen, his first wife. And 
they had a screening room, which was really cool, like a legit screening room. And we got invited because we were very good friends with Marilyn and Bob. But uh, so and she was showing, I think, Lethal Weapon 3, maybe she, had she a maybe pretty... worked on it. Yes. Yeah, I think she was. She oh, she part. played the psychiatrist. Yes. She, that was like a big part for her. Yes. Because she was always she was Mel Gibson's antagonist. So we watched the movie and it was great. I love those Lethal Weapon movies. And it was great. And we I think the too. night's over. And then Bob suddenly says, hey, do you guys mind if I show you a little something? It's it's from this movie I'm working on. I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, great. And it was the scene you were talking about earlier. It's the Dick Cavett show where Forrest Gump has replaced Yoko Ono on the show. Yes. And it was just a little clip. Yes. And everybody in the room and Peter Seaman was there and whoever else was there couldn't talk like we were so blown away by what we had seen. Like, again, how do you do that? Well, once again, you know, it's when face when reading the Forrest Gump screenplay, numerous places th throughout the movie, he's meeting with President Kennedy, yes. President Johnson, President Nixon. Right. He's, you know, of course, on the show and inspiring the lyrics to imagine with John Lennon. Yeah. I mean, you know, actually a scene that got cut out. He was on the Selma Bridge in in Alabama when uh, Martin, Martin Luther, Luther King, King was marching. Unbelievable. He was cut out. But, you know, at the schoolhouse door with Governor Wallace. Yes. All these things like, yeah, cool. How the hell, how the <laughs> how hell do you do, do that? that? And make it look legit. <laughs> but then but how do you even start? Like, where's the footage? So I had two guys hired who combed every library stock footage house to find footage that sort of resembled the screenplay. Right. Then as soon as the writer, Eric Roth and Bob saw the clip, they then rewrote the gotcha. scene so that Forrest could become part of something that existed. Right. Then we had to figure out, well, how do we recreate the sections with Forrest to make it look like he's really there? Right. And it got layered and layered and layered. And we went, oh, my God, this is really something. Now, the Dick Cavett show was the simplest because everybody on the show would play themselves and Forrest would just get inserted dressed as he is. Yes. And and all you did is you had to find a moment when, you know, John Lennon looked and said, you know, said a line. And right. then you just have Forrest lead into the line. Yeah. OK, we can do. And we had Dick Cavett live. But the whole thing, so, I remember that night, like, just it's like crazy. The lips were matching and everybody was just blown away. And at that point, I knew I didn't make that bet with Bob Zemeckis then. <laughs> when the movie came out is when I made the bet. But I did just think like this is uh, we are all, we have just witnessed something, something new, something much more than new. Just something really, really brilliant. Yeah. Uh, OK. Steve Starkey is here on It's Radio with TV's Tim Stack. That's his book, Breaking and Entering, The Education of a Film Producer. Really fun read, especially if you want to read about a guy's journey into filmmaking. And there's a lot of stories in there, too, and anecdotes. But it's really, uh, it's really uh, good stuff. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> 